so good evening everybody uh, today's topic like we discussed is fighting depression and anxiety and i'm dr tulika shukla and i'm a specialist psychiatrist with millennium medical center dubai so we all have heard the, these words depression and anxiety very commonly being used around us but we have many questions how do we know i have depression how do i know i have anxiety when do how will i know that i need help how will i know that i where should i go to seek help and where do i seek help so before we go on to understand what is depression and anxiety we first need to understand what is good mental health what is mental health mental health is defined by world health organization or who as a state of well being in which the individual realizes his or her own abilities they can cope with the normal stresses of life and they can work productively and fruitfully and they are able to make a contribution to their community so like you see it is not merely the absence of a mental illness mental health is much more than that before we go on to understand depression and anxiety let's understand stress in itself stress can be defined as any type of change that causes physical emotional or psychological strain it is the body's response that something requires your attention or action so what is stress stress is basically a physiological or a physical response where the person when they are faced with danger the body will e decide either to fight or flight it is problematic when it is activated in situations where the response is neither appropriate nor required which basically means that stress response is actually a protective response when you are in danger you need it to protect yourself but when there is no actual threat and still the stress response is being activated it becomes a problem similarly once the threat is gone and once the end, anything that has really caused the person to become stressed the perceived threat is gone systems are designed our body is designed to go back to its normal function via something called as a relaxation response the way we respond to stress however makes a very big difference to our overall well being let's understand a little more biologically what is happening when a person is undergoing a stress response so in very brief the sympathetic nervous system is what controls the stimulation of the fight or flight stress response that we just discussed and it is needed for a short term survival whereas the parasympathetic nervous system is what controls the rest and digest uh, response which is basically needed for long term survival let's understand it in a little better way so our sympathetic nervous system whenever we perceive a threat and we need to move ourselves away from that situation quickly these are some of the responses that happens so firstly there is release of adrenaline from our body and your pupils will dilate so that you can see better what is happening in front of you your saliva production will decrease so you will have dryness of mouth your heart rate will increase so that it can pump the blood that your body needs to move away from the threat there will be constriction of blood vessels and your blood pressure will go up the bronchi will dilate so that you can breathe better and you can get more air into your lungs so that you can if you need to move away from that place you can do it quickly your skeletal muscles the muscles that are involved in running are in there is increased blood flow to them your digestive system does not really need that blood at that point of time because you are under threat so there will be reduced uh, blood flow to the digestive system there will be more glucose released into your blood and that is why you would see that uh, one of the components of treatment for uh, depression uh, for uh, hypertension and for people with uh, for with uh, diabetes is that they need to decrease their stress levels whenever they go to the doctor the doctors advise them ki uh, apna stress level kam kariye nahi to aapka blood, your blood pressure and your sugar levels will not come down why do they tell that because like you can see that if the person is chronically under stress it will lead to a state where always their blood pressure is higher and their blood sugars are higher on the other hand parallel to this is the relaxation response where you can see that uh, there it is a relaxed state where none of exact opposite of the sympathetic nervous system is happening 
this is also very important when we will be understanding the treatment of depression so why what is the stress vulnerability model first of all we have understood very clearly what happens to our body when we are under stress there is a release of a lot of cortisol and a lot of adrenaline which causes permanent changes in our body's physiology and permanent changes in our brain what is the stress vulnerability model the stress vulnerability model is a model to explain appearance of psychological symptoms in different psychiatric disorders where it says that under a very high level of stress even a person with no vulnerability will develop illness symptoms this is the line of threshold of development of psychiatric or psychological symptoms so even if a person does not have any vulnerability chronic stress and very severe stress can cause symptoms in that person also on the other hand somebody with a very high vulnerability would develop psych would develop psychiatric symptoms even with very low levels of stress so what does that tell us so that basically means the stress vulnerability model basically tells us that being healthy and being ill are not two very different stages they are on a continuum mental health is on a continuum we will come back to this slide later coming to depression so what is depression very simply put depression is a mental illness now that's a yes and a no yes because yes it is definitely a mental illness because it involves our neurotransmitters it in, involves our brain functioning but it is not just a mental illness because there is also involvement of our endocrine system there is an involvement of our autonomic nervous system there is the implications of depression are there on the entire body so it is actually a whole body illness if you want to understand biologically what is happening in the brain of a person who is undergoing depression this is a neuron and these are the synapses specifically the serotonergic and the noradrenergic synapses in the brain now these synapses are prominently present in specific areas of the brain one area of the brain is the raphe nuclei the raphe nuclei of the brain gives out a lot of serotonergic pathways to the brain for and the, these connections are what uh, get involved so when there is a chronic condition of stress and these serotonergic neurons they get affected there is decreased release of serotonin in these particular pathways it leads to different manifestations of depression and the other very important prominent uh, area that is involved is the hpa axis when i talk about the hpa axis it is the excessive cortisol that is released the excessive adrenaline that is released due to stress that again uh, is affected and the person develops something called uh, called as a dampened stress response sorry the heightened stress response so what are actually the symptoms of depression the symptoms of depression what the clinically the person will see and what the patient will report can be divided into four areas changes in thought or cognition cognition is basically thoughts changes in the emotional state of the person changes which you will see in the person's behavior and changes in their overall physical well being right so if we look at changes in thoughts the most important or the triad that the, we talk about in terms of changes in thought are the negative thoughts about self about the world and about the future which is also known as the beck's cognitive triad what will the person report the person will report uh, negative thoughts about self which basically means they'll say that i am not a worthy person i am of no use they will say that the world is a very dark place they don't see any uh, body anything relevant in the world anymore and about the future they feel hopeless that there is nothing uh, to look forward to in the future so there will be uh, the other symptom in change in their thoughts would be rumination or overthinking 
where the patient will report that I can I constantly keep having these negative thoughts and I cannot stop them. And I want to stop them, I want to go to sleep, but they just keep coming. The other symptom would be uh, developing low self-esteem or not feeling confident doing things that you were very comfortable doing in the past. Person can also develop excessive guilt. They may keep thinking about the past and say, uh, keep thinking about everything they have wrong, done wrong in the past. They might become self-deprecating where they will uh, constantly say how wrong and how bad they are. There can be slowing down of thoughts and information processing. This is a very important uh, uh, symptom in depression where because of which the, there will be problems in concentration and forgetfulness because they cannot, uh, their thoughts have slowed down and they cannot process information at the same speed. They will become, they would look, they will be a little lost. They would be, they will report poor concentration. They will be forgetful in their day-to-day -day activities. Very severe cases, there can be thoughts of self-harm and suicide. Coming to changes in the emotional state, what would be the emotional state of a person suffering from depression? There will be persistent and pervasive low mood. Now here the words persistent and pervasive are very important because persistent would mean that it is present most of the time during the day. So even when I'm sitting with my friends, even when I'm watching a movie, even when I'm uh, working, Internally, I am feeling sad and it is pervasive. No, no, through a, even in different situations, it will continue to feel like that. Even though I'm supposed to be happy in a particular situation, if I'm going out and watching a movie with my friends, I, my mood should change. I should feel better. But that does not seem to happen in depression. And that is how you know that it is different from normal sadness, where you, for example, if somebody fails an exam, they will feel sad about it. But then they will start feeling better about it after a few days and they will cope with it. But that does not seem to happen in depression. And that is how you know that this person needs help. Other thing is feeling sad persistently throughout the day. The low mood can, uh, can be sad. Uh, the other symptom that people report is a lot of people may not come and tell you that I'm feeling sad. They may say that I'm just feeling numb. I'm not feeling anything. I cannot feel happy. I cannot feel sad. I am emotionally blank. Other than this, patients can also report that they are very irritable. They are not feeling sad, but they are pervas pervasively feeling angry. And even small things, uh, they are getting angry very easily. So all these three uh, moods, emotional states of feeling irritable all the time, feeling sad all the time, or feeling emotionally empty all the time can be symptoms of depression. Other than this, they will report that they no longer enjoy activities that used to be fun, which is known as anhedonia. They may say that they are feeling slowed down and tired all the time. Coming to changes in behavior, uh, more with the, the people who have depression, they will become more and more withdrawn and isolated. They will stop going out. They will stop meeting people. There might be dramatic changes in their appetite. There might, might first, most of the times, uh, people report that they're not feeling hungry at all. Sometimes uh, in atypical depression, it is possible that they may have hyperphagia uh, where they are eating excessively or they are eating irregularly and they are eating poor nutritive quality food, uh, which basically means that there is something called as emotional eating. They are not eating for nourishment of their body. They are eating to alleviate the negative mood they are experiencing. Emotional eating is a separate thing. I will not cover here. Uh, coming to sleep disturbances. Person may report that they are not able to fall asleep. They are not uh, getting good sleep. They are unrefreshed. And in atypical depression, it is possible that they may report hypersomnia. So hypersomnia and hyperphagia can be there in atypical depression and needs to be elicited when the person comes to the psychiatrist. Similarly, there is lack of energy to do any day-to-day -day routine activities. So because of which the person would either be lying in bed all day or they would have a lot of procrastination. In extreme, extreme cases, there can also be complete neglect of their personal hygiene and grooming. What will they report in terms of their physical well-being? They will report that they have very easy fatigability. They get tired after very little activity. They will feel sluggish in their thoughts and movements. Poor sleep, poor appetite, change in weight. 
this is also a very uh, dramatic symptom of depression where their people will report loss of significant loss of weight uh, during a depressive episode there can be changes in physical activity like i said they would not go out and they would stay uh, withdrawn and at home all the time and they may also experience a lot of physical aches and pains and they may also experience digestive issues coming to diagnosis of depression so how will you diagnose somebody as having depression first would be a detailed psychiatric history and all the symptoms that i just mentioned to you when taking a history you will cover all these questions second would be the mental status examination while i am interviewing the person and while you are observing the person their current mental state they will report all the depressive symptoms uh, assessments certain specific scales like bdi or madras or uh, hamilton depression rating scale can be used for objective assessment of how bad is a person's depression a detailed medical history will also be taken because uh, many times there can be a lot of medical disorders which can be comorbid with depression especially thyroid disorders hypertension diabetes these are all very common comorbidities with depression uh, so similarly the physical examination of a person to rule out any of these disorders as well as any other neurological uh, condition which might be there for example stroke patients post stroke also depression can be a very common uh, comorbidity and lab tests so like i mentioned that all these uh, medical illnesses can be there comorbidly we need to do certain lab tests to rule them out even uh, vitamin d deficiency and vitamin b12 deficiency can also add to the uh, depressive symptoms of a person and they may not respond to treatment Uh, if you do not correct these problems so what diagnosis when you come to diagnosis like i mentioned that you take a detailed history uh, depression in itself like i said i explained the symptoms of depression to you but there are different types of depression and the treatment across these differs in in, in across these different diagnoses so uh, the detailed history is very important to understand what is the type of depression the person is undergoing so that it can be treated appropriately for example bipolar depression will not be treated the same way as unipolar depression or for that matter adjustment disorder the treatment would be very different from your recurrent depressive disorder coming to uh, the second thing that you need to do uh, by, when you are treating depression is to understand what is the severity of depression so if somebody has severe depression in that case the person would probably require to get admitted but if the somebody has mild to moderate depression we can start op based treatment and we can get uh, the person can get better over time and similarly the duration of symptoms if the du duration of illness is very short only 2 3 weeks and the symptoms have appeared opd based treatment is well is fair enough coming to what should you do if any of these things are happening to you so i discussed in detail about what are symptoms of depression what do you do first so you need to see a psychiatrist first of all basically to get a proper diagnosis and to rule out all these other different types of uh, depression that i mentioned so firstly you need to get a proper diagnosis you need to rule out all other possibilities and comorbidities you need to understand the severity of symptoms and then according to these three things only you will get the appropriate management of depression now what are the different uh, in treatment of depression what are the different components most important uh, one of the most important parts of treatment of depression is the medication the medications there are three four common type of medications that we use in depression one is ssris or selective serotonergic Uh, reuptake inhibitors now i explained previously in previous slides how the serotonergic pathways and the norepinephrine pathways are the main pathways that are involved in depression and that is why the drugs that we use for depression are serotonergic and noradrenergic predominantly all these medications ssris snris and tcas are uh, related to other than this coming to psychotherapy psychotherapy is another very important uh, area where uh, 
a very important modality of treatment of depression. Cognitive behavior therapy and interpersonal therapy are two therapies which have maximum evidence. But similarly, mindfulness, uh, basic relaxation exercises, psychodynamic therapy, these are all different methods of therapies that are used. Lifestyle interventions are also equally important because if uh, not only do we need, so basically you look at medication and psychotherapy. These are two very important uh, methods of treating depression. But additionally, lifestyle interventions and social treatments are also required. These are additional. Lifestyle interventions and social treatments are adjuvant treatments. Mainstay of treatment is medication and psychotherapy. Coming to treatment of depression, I think I already told you about antidepressants and these chemicals that uh, the drugs that we are using for uh, chemical names of the drugs that we are using. Supportive medications. Now, when the person, it is important to understand that these SSRIs, SNRIs, TCAs, these drugs, these medications, they need three to four weeks to show that proper effect. In that duration, person also requires some supportive medications. If you're not getting any sleep and you're hardly sleeping for two hours in the night, you definitely need something to help you in that short period of time. So these supportive medications are generally given for a small period of time till the antidepressants take their action. And then the antidepressants are continued for at least six months to a year, depending upon how bad the depression was to begin with. Now, it is important to understand that everyone reacts differently and there is no one size fits all approach to medication. And the medications have to be tailored to your symptoms to the severity of your symptoms, to the tolerance of side effects, and the preference of the patient. Uh, coming to the psychological treatment of depression, it is important to understand that there are different theories of depression. And depending on these theories, only the psychological treatments have been developed. I, this is all theoretical, so I will not go into the psychological theories per se. But if we look at the treatment of depression, the most evidence-based and the most effective treatment of depression is CBT. Uh, when I was talking about cognitive symptoms of depression or uh, the disorders, problem in the thoughts in depression, we talked about cognitive triad or Beck's triad, where in depression, the person has developed negative thoughts about self, about the world and about the future. And in CBT, the attempt is to correct them in a systematic manner. So the therapist will work with you uh, and look for, they will start with your thoughts. They will ask you to keep a thought diary and they will ask you, they will challenge those cognitive distortions or cognitive errors and, with, and gradually in a systematic manner, work, uh, work towards correcting these cognitive distortions. Other than that, uh, interpersonal therapy, like I said, it focuses mainly on improving the relationships and helping you express emotions in healthy ways. Now, which type of therapy should be chosen for a patient depends upon detailed history taking and it depends upon client. It depends upon the patient itself. What kind of therapy would be applicable in this patient? So a person might be a very good candidate for CBT but uh, they will not do well with psychodynamic therapy. Similarly, there might be a patient who would do very well with, uh, they may only need stress management. They may not need complete CBT. So this decision will be uh, taken by the therapist and the psychiatrist, and it is done according to the client's needs. Now coming, so I think we have covered the treatment of, along with this, uh, there, like, like I said, Lifestyle interventions and social uh, uh, treatment, uh, components of treatment are essential parts of treatment. So if somebody has very poor social support or they are the kind of people who will do better by getting themselves involved in some community work and to, so that they can find some meaning, those kind of things can also be done and can also be advised. Uh, lifestyle, and a lot of people find peace with those kind of methods, but these are only additional treatments. Similarly, lifestyle interventions like physical exercise, yoga, meditation, nutrition, these are additional things they can do to overall improve their well being because if they feel better uh, in their day to day lives, it will also improve their mood over time. Now, coming to anxiety disorders, 
what is anxiety anxiety is the mind and body's acute reaction to stressful dangerous or unfamiliar situations it is a sense of uneasiness distress or dread you feel before a significant event having said that all of us have felt anxious at some point or the other in our lives but and a certain level of anxiety is in fact important because it keeps us alert and aware but if for a person who is suffering from an anxiety disorder it is very far from normal and it can be quite debilitating so what is you some of you might say that uh, this is the same as stress response how is it different so anxiety is more of the cognitive component of what the person experiences and stress response is more of a physiological response of what is happening inside the body what happens to their biological or physiological parameters so if you look at anxiety so if you look at the physical symptoms of anxiety they are exactly the same as the stress response they are all symptoms of autonomic uh, nervous system or the sympathetic nervous system over activity cold or sweaty hands shortness of breath palpitations or chest pain dry mouth numbness or tingling nausea muscle tension dizziness somatic symptoms like headaches stomach aches restlessness and sleep disturbances these are all physical symptoms of anxiety if we talk about the cognitive symptoms of anxiety what would the person experience people report a sense of panic where they feel that things are completely out of their control and they cannot manage their anxiety they feel that they they may report a sense of impending doom that uh, or they may feel that they may uh, completely go crazy they may feel uneasiness they may, they may report constant and persistent worrying where there is a lot of uh, what will happen if this doesn't happen what if kind of thoughts where they would constantly be thinking about what can go wrong in the future there can be nightmares there can be a lot of reassurance seeking they may uh, before doing anything they might be very indecisive and before doing anything think in different ways five or six ways they may think about it and ask other people and try to understand uh, what can go wrong inattention and poor focus then because obviously because of the excessive worrying and being in a constant state of autonomic hyperarousal their attention and their focus would not be very good and they may have avoidance anything that pro, uh, provokes their anxiety they may start avoiding those situations if we look at uh, so there is an overlap in depression and anxiety in terms of sleep disturbances the restlessness concentration difficulties irritability fatigue this is feeling tired all the time these can be reported by both uh, groups of people they it can be there in depression and anxiety but qualitatively if you look at a depressed person and you look at an anxious person they are very different depression and anxiety qualitative would be very different where one is characterized by significant physiological arousal and so sympathetic overactivity depression is associated with a pervasive low energy and negative thoughts prominently so what are the different types of anxiety disorders a uh, generalized anxiety disorder where uh, most of the worries and apprehensions are about future and about day to day activities social anxiety which is where the uh, threat is mostly uh, interacting in public and going out and meeting other people or authority figures specific phobias where the anxiety or the fear is irrational and it is associated with one very specific stimuli for example heights or flying or of insects it's only when it is so bad uh, that the person cannot even so if the so we all have a fear of heights but uh, if it is so bad that the person cannot even go on their terrace and they feel that it is impairing them and they need to get it addressed they can uh, get treatment for it panic disorder panic disorder is getting persistent panic attacks again and again without having any other anxiety disorders panic attacks can be present in any of the anxiety disorders because panic is just uncontrollable anxiety coming in a very short period of time and so it's it's like anxiety is there all the time but panic attack is extreme burst of anxiety which is short lasting 
uh, obsessive compulsive disorders were previously considered to be an anxiety disorder, but now in ICD-11 and in DSM-5, they have been moved to a separate group altogether because they think, uh, because now the understanding is it is not just anxiety. There is uh, the obsessive quality of OCD has, so that's why they have been moved to a different group of disorders. And PTSD, PTSD again is when somebody has faced some very traumatic situation and following that they develop sig significant uh, hyperarousal symptoms. So uh, what is wrong in the brain when somebody is experiencing, neuro, uh, uh, experiencing anxiety disorders? So what has been seen is that here serotonin is involved, the serotonergic pathways are involved and predominantly the GABA pathways are also involved. And uh, norepinephrine is also seen to be impaired, but predominantly it is serotonin and GABA. There is overactivity of the fear circuit. Now the fear circuit is basically your amygdala and your uh, areas which are surrounding the amygdala in the brain. Amygdala is considered to be the fear center of our brain. Uh, there is an, so what happens in anxiety disorders? Firstly, there is an exaggerated amygdala activation it is also seen that nucleus accumbens is accumulated because that this area, this particular area, nucleus accumbens is related to defensive reactions whenever a person is faced by threat. The medial cortical areas are down, which down regulate the amygdala is also, is also found to be weakened in some people with anxiety disorders, the response of this area. And the BNST, the BNST is considered to be the area which perceives uncertainty. So there is something called as intolerance of uncertainty in anxiety disorders. When you don't know what, whether something is a threat or not, the bed nucleus of stria terminalis, so BNST seems to get overactivated in such people and it limits behavior and because this area is involved in behavioral inhibition and risk assessment. So if you look at anxiety, the understanding of what we have today or what is theorized to be the uh, happening in anxiety disorders is this uncertain threat, the BNST or from the extended amygdala gets involved. So normally when we are under threat, our sensory systems will perceive the threat and we will either have a defensive reaction or a defensive action depending upon how the information is processed. But in case of anxiety disorders, uncertain threats are also perceived by the BNST as a threat and they are uh, put on uh, and they uh, lead to the similar flight and fight responses that you see when you are under an actual threat. So like I said, uh, the amygdala is overactive and it uh, gives out outputs to the, uh, the basolateral amygdala gives outputs to the central nucleus of amygdala and the BNST, the uh, Head nucleus of stria terminalis. They are all connected to the brain stem, the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus will again re release the chemicals, the neuroendocrine system gets involved. And the BLA is under reciprocal control of the frontal cortical structures, the PFC, the prefrontal cortex and the ACC. Now this is very important because you can see that amygdala causes overactivity and uh, overactivity will act on these areas, but then these areas also have an ability to uh, uh, so, sort of a top-down regulation of the activity of the amygdala. So your higher cortical centers can dampen the responses of the amygdala. The so, so this is important when we are trying to understand uh, relaxation techniques and we are trying to understand mindfulness techniques. This is how it is happening. Coming to medications, uh, like we said, anxiolytics are very important uh, tree part of treatment in, uh, ben in your uh, anxiety disorders. So benzodiazepines is one group. Other than that, there are drugs like opipramol and there are other anxiolytic drugs. Even propranolol uh, beta blockers are used because there is a lot of autonomic hyperactivity. So beta blockers, benzodiazepines, Drugs like opipramol, these can be used as anxiolytic buspirone. These can be used as anxiolytic drugs. Antidepressants, because again, prominent problem is happening in the serotonergic pathways. Uh, SSRIs are the mainstay of treatment. Decycloserine is, is an experimental drug. It is not, uh, it is used with therapy. 
it is used with psychotherapy not used uh, on its own on its own it is not going to help in the anxiety it is used in in uh, during therapy sessions to bolster the learning and uh, impact the uh, fear dampening response in therapy so uh, decyclosine in itself is not going to be useful in lowering the anxiety coming to psychological treatments treatment in anxiety disorders is mostly based on exposure and systematic desensitization and so this is the behavioral component of treatment and then there are also certain cognitive approaches which are used so i have uh, here talked about specifically what kind of therapy is used in what kind of anxiety disorder so for this basically uh, what i'm trying to show is that phobias social anxiety disorders generalized anxiety disorders each of the anxiety disorders have highly manualized cognitive behavior therapy treatments so according to each anxiety disorder the manuals are different and the therapist will use according to your diagnosis they will use specific techniques which are applicable in your situation so the treatment the psychological therapy and the psychological methods that will be used for somebody with phobias will be very different from uh, from the kind of treatment that is used for panic disorder let's say so uh, what is very important here to understand is that uh, the relaxation response is a very important part of all these cbt treatments and we don't have control over sympathetic uh, uh lee what is happening in our body but we can all control our parasympathetic responses and that is the premise of uh, treating anxiety disorders using cbt and other relaxation strategies and mindfulness based strategies 